Uh, good morning, Hildor. Your environment now. Keith Fives in here, and I'm so excited to see you again. You're outside. You're lovely. You look like Mother Earth reincarnated right here. So I'm excited. So what's up today? I think we're up uh, to episode seven, right? Yes, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> Well, I could do this every day. Well, we're going to be starting with talking about my favorite thing. I've invited Max Goldman back because he's initiated an amazing uh, project. He's our local youth leader. And uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that as uh, the sun is burning hotter each year, as any star would, um, and I think some scientists um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the scientists on this call, but uh, I think the sun is burning 25% hotter than it did in the beginning of, of the life on Earth. Uh, but in this self-regulatory nature um, of um, the story of life on Earth, uh, we're not 25% hotter on Earth thanks to my backdrop. This is a live backdrop. Um, so we have the green cover that's meeting the heating with uh, cooling us here on Earth. And uh, some genius species that call themselves the wise one decided to start chopping away at their only defense, their best defense for staying cool, uh, cutting these down. And, and thankfully, oh. um, there seems to be some evolution in intelligence uh, amongst our uh, species members. So I'm going to invite Max to speak on his project, the Tree Rescue Project. Oh, great. Yes. Great. Hi, hi, Max. You look great today. How are you? Thank you. Good. How are you? Good, 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 good. Uh, and you've got a presentation for us as well, right? Yes. The Tree Rescue Project. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, I'm calling it Project Tree Rescue. And what it is, is Hopefully, you know, we'll get a lot of residents in Port Washington, and if people are interested, they can start this in their own towns. Um, they're going to rescue self-sprouted trees from their yards and flower beds and put them in pots, grow them so they can, you know, establish themselves a bit, and then donate them to other local residents. So it's kind of like a book swap, uh, but with trees. And uh, hopefully this can provide wildlife habitat, and we can reap the human benefits from planting trees. Uh, some of which Hilder just mentioned. And um, if you want to get involved, which I suggest everybody does um, get involved because this has the potential to be really cool, I think. Um, you can follow at Long Island Naturalist on Instagram. That's where I will be posting updates. Um, I've already posted a few things which you can look at through the bio of the uh, Instagram where you'll see it's a little circle that says uh, tree rescue, or you can visit the site below I don't have a domain yet, but um, you can copy that in, and there's a lot of information on there. Okay, so, yeah. so, so Max, it's uh, just the uh, website is maxbg61.wixsite.com mm -hmm. forward slash project tree rescue. Great. Yes. And, and this is where we'll get some more information about uh, rescuing self sprouted trees. So, uh, in as far as that process is concerned, will people really understand? Uh, specifically what they need to be doing uh, or, or how to identify those particular trees? Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully um, people will be able to identify some of the trees, um, but if not, I've encouraged people um, to reach out if they have any questions. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can contact me, either through the Instagram or through um, the email contacts.naturedude uh, at um, gmail.com, which is on the website as well. And uh, through that, I should be able to identify the trees. And so this would be an example of a tree that you wouldn't want to plant. Um, this is, we're only accepting native trees and this is an invasive, this one looks like a sycamore maple. Um, it could be a Norway maple. There might be two trees in there. Looks like there might be two trees, but um, some of the more common saplings are invasive trees. So it is important um, that people plant the native ones. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to avoid any invasive tree planting. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Hildur, uh, as far as uh, 
you know, this is concerned. I know this is a huge project and a new, huge undertaking, but it really does also help the environment and help us to populate trees so that we get more air and we get more um, uh, capability. As you say, this is our natural defense, our natural resource, and we have a lot of folks that really not only are not honoring them, but are destroying them in the process. So here's an opportunity to rescue the trees, yeah? Exactly. And, um, and I've invited my friend David Yakim, our local biodiversity expert, to speak on uh, our neck of the woods, if you want. And uh, especially uh, lately, I've been very interested in beavers. Um, I don't know if, if that um, strikes a chord, but somebody I know um, shared this with me the other day, the, the beaver pledge. Have you seen this one? No. I, I pledge allegiance to the streams and the beaver ponds of America and to the to renewal, the renewal which, they which they stand, stand. one river, river underground, underground. Irreplaceable. irreplaceable, with Your habitat, habitat and, and wetlands for all. all. So yeah. the, 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 the interesting thing is beavers were misunderstood for the longest time and even endangered at one point. And I'd love for David to speak on that. Please, uh, yeah. and, and also the fact that our salt marshes are probably our best uh, defense uh, against uh, uh, both uh, global warming, but also biodiversity crisis the, the marshes are uh, really worth protecting. So I would like David to speak on that. Excellent. And if it's possible, Hilder, to pull up the slideshow that I sent you for Earth Expeditions. Yes. Earth, Earth Expeditions is a project that Hilder and I carry on uh, and Antonia for the NACUS, uh, to take youth out into the woods to have learning experiences. And now we are doing that on Zoom. So. The presentation that I'm giving you is uh, similar to one of those presentations in Zoom. Oh, oh great. David, would you go back just a, mo a moment? So yes. it's Earth Expeditions takes kids out to the woods to help them to identify indigenous plants and uh, so on and so forth. Is that what you were saying? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Keith, you broke up. Yeah, can, Earth Expeditions, can you, uh, how would people get information about that? Oh. So it's a high school, uh, I'm sorry, it's a, a program for middle school students. We are in the middle of publishing our findings. So uh, we'll disseminate that once, once they're published. Perfect, thank you very much, David. Wonderful, and in fact, when it comes to our mailing list, uh, we will mail it out to those interested individuals. Okay, great. <clears throat> so the beaver, Castor canadensis, uh, called by the Native Americans, the sacred center. We refer to it as a keystone species, a flagship species. The sacred center because uh, the beavers created an ecosystem that thrived and provided food for beavers, but also for Native Americans. The habitats the beavers provided, actually before uh, we arrived, uh, extended uh, across the eastern United States into the Midwest. There were 80 to 300 million beavers across the United States. That's as many people as we have. And they formed a gigantic wetland complex. And the wetlands would flow from the inland into the sea. In fact, there was a whole ecosystem in the Atlantic Ocean that was generated by debris and trees that washed through the river into the sea that we have lost that ecosystem. We've, we've uh, lost- David, David, yes, would, would you, I, I've pulled up your habitat map Excellent. that you have created of our um, peninsula here. So yes, the, yes. Beavers, the beavers, the um, beavers, um, could you just speak uh, a little bit about what absolutely. we have left here? Yes, so uh, for those of you who do not recognize this peninsula that juts into the Long Island Sound, 30 miles, 30, 20 miles, uh, east of New York City, thereabouts. Um, this is Port Wa the Port Washington Peninsula. Uh, this is a, a habitat map. This was my thesis project in my master's degree. Uh, I mapped uh, using infrared imagery. I mapped out all the different types of habitats in Port Washington. A habitat is a place 
where plants and animals live. If you go back to that previous slide briefly, the light blue indicates development. Uh, so that's uh, a large portion of portion. The other colors represent different types of habitats, water, marsh, forest, meadow, etc. You can get a sense of how developed we are. To the next slide, please. So uh, different ways of looking at the land. Okay. And so, here we are. Yes, and so here we are. And, and so this is a map that I developed uh, of the Hempstead Harbor regional area. From 2012 to 2017, I formed, I, I was, I've been studying the green area, the Hempstead Harbor Nature Sanctuary. I found, and you'll see in the slides, it, it is the most important habitat in Port Washington. It's only 120 acres, but it packs the largest diversity of species and especially bird, uh, waterfowl in Port Washington. And the scary part is the aerodrome is right next to it. <laughs> That's well, the not, is that? Even not, they're, they're good stewards of the land. I, I, I'm trying to convince them to transform their aerodrome into meadow. Yeah. And uh, it's a hard fight, but we might get one acre out of it. So uh, anyhow. Here we are. Is, here we are. And in <laughs> fact, this is in our town. Uh, the water level, I can tell you, is over five or six feet deep in the upper left-hand corner. I know because I've walked it. <laughs> and um, every year this floods, it drains into the Hempstead Harbor. This is the open waters of the preserve, aforementioned preserve. In particular, since I was the first person to really discover it, uh, in, in the 1970s, a gigantic wall of sediment was placed along Northern Boulevard, which blocked a stream and flooded 40 acres of wetland. It, this is why I call it Serendipity Pond. It was formed by a, a, a fortuitous accident. And these are all different types of habitats that support different types of animals. So each of these different pictures shows that here too, forests, uh -huh. is composed of different groups of species. Here you can see the rich soil uh, underneath the forest in the preserve. Amazing. Yeah. And the interior birds. And forest interior birds. Scientists have found that many bird species, um, they, they nest in interior forests and they actually need to 200 meters away from uh, human development in order to reproduce. So in the center of the sand pits is habitat for these rare birds. And, and we have... Them. And then we have the wetlands. A this is a polluted wetland that was named Frog Pond. And in the lower left-hand corner is one of the most interesting species. It's a, it's a clam shrimp. Uh, this particular clam shrimp, there's only seven populations known in the world. And they all curiously have, have adapted to live in the puddles that are made by tires and ATVs. Mm. Go figure. Uh, and then these are the sand castles, the pinnacles of till, uh, over 120,000 years old that stick into the sky. And you can actually see across the way, just above that, the uh, power plant uh, at the very top. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so these are, these are 70 million year old um, clays with sandstone inclusions that include fossils, uh, fossilized magnolia. Sam can speak more to, Max can speak more to it. This is just, and uh, these are some of the birds, animals that I have observed. Uh, these are not my photographs, but they all uh, exist along with, I didn't mention deer and also beaver, at least one beaver. <laughs> you said so. I'm gonna yes. believe. I'm gonna believe you on that. I'm gonna believe that you actually. Well, this is. Uh, well, I'll, I need to. Uh, <laughs> I only have. A, I only have a few minutes, so I, I want to. Yeah, on. yeah. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna stop sharing so we can see each other. Um, so you claim Excellent. to have. Uh, you claim to have seen signs of beaver activity in that area. Yes. So. <laughs> Um, interesting. So, so I observed a mammal that was several feet long with fur diving from, uh, coming out from the water and then diving in. That could only be a beaver or a river otter. 
I spoke with Mike Bottini, who studies river otters on Long Island. He said, yeah, could be a river otter. But I found next to it, nearby, a beaver chew, which is oh. a chew that has been eaten up by beavers. Uh, and actually, uh, we, there's a slide there, but we can, no, let's not interrupt right now. And yes. this beaver chew, I couldn't believe there's a beaver in Port Washington. So uh, that's, it, so that's what we're now going to do. We're, we brought back the monarch butterfly. David founded the Port Washington Monarch Alliance that then expanded into rewild Long Island. So that was, he, he started with this beautiful flagship uh, species because uh, nobody wants to save the bees, they sting. So and, we, and um, we, we, we made it all about the monarch, but I think we should go into 2020 to... and, and bring back the beaver. What do you think, right. David? Okay, <laughs> yes. So I don't think Fort Washington can support beavers, unfortunately. No? <laughs> we can support deer and nobody thought about that. But, well. <laughs> but, but the most amazing thing is this, this beaver swam across the Long Island Sound, or yes. beavers. Yes. And it, it, it crossed west, it cro went up a hill, it crossed West Shore Road, and only about 5% of Port Washington is wetland. And, and, I think, and I think we should point out that beavers are important because they create habitats. So that's, that's how right. they support, that's how they support biodiversity because, and, and, yes, yes. and, and that's what we care about di biodiversity because it's our, um, uh, that's I'll the only that. way we'll thrive. Well, we'll have to speak about that next time because John, uh, John Halpern oh. is here and I'm so excited to fit everything into this half an hour, David. So let's yes. uh, expand on this topic we next time. Thanks a lot. Uh, we continued uh, more about biodiversity and Port Washington and uh, our region and beavers yes. next time. Yes, exactly. Thanks, thanks, David. So, John. Here nice I am. To, Hello. Nice to meet you in this way. Uh, one day we'll meet in person. How are you? I'm fine. I'm very, um, I'm very strong and happy here in the upper uh, environs of, of Manhattan, about 200 meters away from the cloisters and about uh, 300 meters away from the Hudson River. <laughs> wonderful, w wonderful. Would you uh, explain to us all what you're about? Cultural activism, filmmaking. I saw a sculpture, a breathable, um, you called it breath. Um, remind me, where um, you, you've done so many interesting things. You've lived inside the biosphere. Yes. Um, I yes. saw one of, your, one of your interactive sculptures would not be good for Corona times, the one where they place the air on there. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I want to um, correct that, that concept because, um, and I'll get to that. But, okay. um, but that was the fresh air sculpture. That's and uh, I think it's actually quite, quite urgent now to look at that as a, as a metaphor. Um, but uh, it happens that yesterday was the 19th of, of May and 43 years earlier, um, I formed an organization with a few friends um, that was what I would call cultural activism, using an art form to revision society with the sort of um, directive perhaps to reshape society, um, modify uh, how, we, how we live and interact in a sustainable way. So we climbed up on every bridge in New York City there are seven large bridges. And the idea was to push out terrorism from the news because there was terrorism in an overwhelming dimension that was quite overwhelming and oppressive. So we wanted to create a beautiful image of people climbing up the bridges as an inspiration, uh, as a community, not just as one artist like a Christo or a Warhol or a Louise Nevelson. So we climbed up on every bridge in Manhattan at rush hour 43 years ago. Yesterday was the anniversary. And we um, made the, the world news. It was called bridging. And so that was a real uh, hallmark or a, a sort of a watershed moment where artists could act as a group um, as a collective creative force um, using their art form to make not just a social statement but to provide um, solutions 
creative solution processes. Um, these works that I'm discussing were shown at the Tate Gallery, the Tate, the Tate Gallery in London um, in the uh, mid 1990s. And it was shown in a context called New Consume. So in Switzerland, where I lived for 11 years, uh, I, I had a project that actually won a prize from the Swiss government called New Consume Alps Project, which was um, a project with unemployed people in Switzerland, uh, creating a, an art cookie, a cookie that you could eat that was in the shape of a mountain, the size of my hand. So uh, unemployed people produced and sold these cookies. What I did before that was called smoke sculpture because I was showing my movies at film festivals around Europe and I was becoming uh, toxic from all the cigarette smoke. And the movie was about Joseph Beuys, who was one of the founders of the European Green Movement and a world-class you know, uh, cultural activist and sculptor. Some of you may know or have heard of Joseph Beuys, but he was a friend of mine. He learned about my work, discovered me through the bridging project. So. During these film screenings, I was so freaked out because everyone was smoking in the theaters all around <laughs> that I asked people to please put their cigarette smoke in plastic bags. And um, <laughs> we sent the cigarette smoke in plastic bags back to cigarette factories all over Europe with a thousand people. Um, the next thing that I did was called breath sculpture, yeah, which you mentioned, a biosphere. And in <laughs> fact, I called, uh, I was in contact with the uh, organization in Tucson, Arizona, the Biosphere 2, which m some of you may know was a, a biosphere that about, I think, seven or eight people lived in for what was going to become a two-year or a three-year project. Now, my theory was that I could live in a small glass space about as big as this room um, and breathe interactively with plants. Depending solely on the oxygen the plants would give me to survive and that the plants would benefit from my carbon dioxide so that as I exhaled and the plants absorbed the carbon dioxide plants grow, maybe you all know that, but the biomass of a plant is carbon dioxide. So my exhalation was growing the surface area of the plants that were providing oxygen for me to survive. And I breathed once a minute for 10 unbroken days. So it was a yoga training, it was a meditation process. I meditated on what the Tibetans call the bardo, uh, in which the body, uh, as, upon dying, the body dissolves into the five basic elements of earth, fire, air, water, and space. So I did this practice for um, 10 days in this uh, hermetically sealed glass house in Holland. And that was called breath sculpture. Now that was seen all over the world. It was reported in the news. It was a big deal. Um, my work has tried to expand and in a sense shatter the uh, conventional structures of the art market so that um, my work would be seen on the streets, um, on the bridges, working with organizations that I called Art Corporation of America Incorporated or the Art for the 21st Century Organization or New Consume. And now uh, we are starting the Institute for Cultural Activism International. Um, so, oh, jetzt sind wir schon mal beim einmal zwei. Das sorry? Kätzchen hat acht. Oh yes, I wanted to speak to what you mentioned on carbon dioxide and plants. Okay, can you so, hold uh, it? Of course, yes. Yeah. So, having now uh, accomplished the ten-day period of breathing alone and been like the star in the glass box, I um, I'm just looking for the glass box. Actually, I have a model of my glass box here, but imagine that there's one person in a glass box for 10 days that everybody's looking at. The iconic, you know, um, performer, okay? Now, I always wanted to work with people, 
groups of people. So, and you can see that from my, my other work, but uh, I decided to provide fresh air for people to breathe uh, in mobile glass uh, compartments or mobile glass um, spaces. So I produced these large sort of um, transportable glass boxes with green plants inside the boxes. And I think you all understand. Um, so people outside the glass box could uh, take a mask, cover their face, Hilder, with a with a a, a, um, a surgical mask. In fact, an N95 mask. Everybody had to cover their mouth, take a a, a, a respiration mask from the hospital grade respiration mask, with two tubes. So you would take the mask to your face, almost like you're praying. You take the mask to your face and you inhale, you inhale oxygen from the plants. And from the other side, you exhale carbon dioxide back into the chamber where of course the air would be you know, transformed, carbon dioxide transformed by the plants and the human breath into breathable air for people on the next day. So you have the interdependency with trees, with plants, with nature, and the interdependency of people to people. We create the air for people to breathe on the consecutive day on, on, on today. So it's kind of like mouth to mouth resuscitation with plants. Love it. That was, Love that was called fresh air. It's Love it. John, so John. brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, Hildor, uh, John has um, a film that I think would be great if for our next show, uh, which is uh, not only about the breathable plants, but uh, the, you know, very, very expressive. And I love this idea and this concept of being able to bring this into the, the now. It's so, it's so very, very current and so very appropriate, don't you think? Absolutely. And, and the way we shift the cultural consciousness is in storytelling, using art as a way to connect and relate. And that's the most powerful way to change habits because science, uh, although I'm a scientist, uh, the science needs the art form to communicate with uh, the, the general public, I think. Right. It's very, I'd like and, to speak for just a minute, Hilda. Yes, yes, and then I would like to, I would really like everyone who is on the call because we have such a good, we have like a biodiverse group of activists and educators here on the call. I'd really sure. like to start Let's an interactive that. with John because um, we would like to sort of uh, get access to more of this yes. knowledge of how to communicate uh, uh, these important, I think we... On, on, on this, Hilda, briefly, so um, in, we were talking about CO2 and plants and how plants uh, take CO2 into them and build biomass and that mass sequesters carbon from the atmosphere and it puts it either into the plant or into the ground. I have some figures here. So uh, before pre-industrial times, the amount of carbon in the air was two, 280 parts per million. In recent history, carbon levels have not increased above 300 parts per million. There was a movement in the early 2000s that we should limit our PPA, uh, parts per million to 350. 350.org is the movement. Now we have at this time 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. And if we continue business as usual, we will have at least 500 parts per million in the atmosphere, which will lead to two degrees Celsius warming or, thank or, you, or. David. Thank you. I really appreciate that, and it's appropriate that you're appearing in dark, in the dark, <laughs> as you give us the data. There's no uh, uh, video, but yeah. we are now. Uh, I think what's very. I was trying to pick a, a YouTube video uh, of John Halpern's work to show to you, but as we're running out of time, I think we should start the next segment with two selected videos of his work and how to relate um, uh, to the community in, in this uh, art form. And I would love to open up to anyone who hasn't spoken yet. And that includes all of the rest of you on the call. If you have questions or thoughts or would like to um, expand on what we've been speaking about. Great, before we go there, Hildur, I just want to thank John for uh, stimulating 
us with the visuals and the artwork, uh, the art form, if you will, specifically as it is an expressive uh, uh, area that really does evoke uh, some questions in our mind and how we can do things a little differently, especially as it relates to the environment. So, so glad you could join. Absolutely. And I, I feel back to the spiritual aspect of it as well. Thank you, John. Yes. And John, I've, I've placed here uh, two links to your work in the chat. If uh, you can see the chat on the side and, 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 and um, if you can't wait until next week, you can look up uh, John Halpern's work is uh, online and, and it's really an honor to have you here with distinction for, thank you for all your work. And uh, that uh, we're I'm, I'm excited here. to I'm here, I hope, to, uh, to continue this work with all of you. And yes. um, that's what cultural activism is about. So in yes. fact, we're, we're about to start you know, our website interviewing people who are cultural activists around the world. And we certainly want to invite you all to be part of that. Yeah. Hilders, Hilders showing yes. her. Yes. Her. <laughs> it looks so, where are Daddy. you? Where are you actually today? I'm in my I'm in my um I'm in my backyard. Where is that? Where is that? Uh, I'm in Port Washington and uh, this is yeah. this is my office, my home office. Yeah. <laughs> I like your umbrella. Yeah. Very green. Yeah, right. And, and blue, green and blue. Thank you. It's a live backdrop. Everyone has been playing with these kind of uh, Zoom <laughs> yeah. backdrops. I, I, right. like, I like when things are real. So I'd love to call on, uh, on Steve or Paul, Claire, Rachel, I don't know. Nice to meet you. And Ingrid is, is here too. So I'd is love that Rachel to, Lagoska? I would love for us to have a more of an interactive here uh, feeling in the end of yes, the show. Yes. Would, would you please call upon Rachel Lagoska? Yes. Oh, Rachel, you're muted. He's unmuted oh. now. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I worked with Dave when he was an undergraduate saving beavers in New Paltz. <gasps> and he has moved on to uh, back to Port Washington. I'm still here. Uh, the beavers are still here. And uh, I've started growing mushrooms and keeping bees. That's all well, I have to say. <laughs> I love that. I think we'll end with a beaver pledge today. Uh, nice to meet you. I hope you join us going forward. And, and Stephen has a Stephen has a point he'd like to raise. Go ahead, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, I just I think it's uh, great that here I am watching something that about nature that's not just talking about science, but it's talking equally about truth, but but looking at it through you know, the lens from the other side of the brain. And I think uh, it's really important that we engage, you know, left brain and right brain, you know, uh, truth and beauty um, in order to get like the full picture, in order to communicate in a way that, uh, that appeals to lots of different people and, and, and uh, communicates really like a bigger, more complete picture of the reality that we're all trying to uh, attain here is, you know, try to try to appeal not just to the intellect, but uh, the affect as well. You know, they say that um, you'll only say something you could, I can't remember the thing, but you know, you could know all you want, but you know, uh, it, you, people will only act when they, when they feel connected. So it's, it's important. So it's really nice to uh, have an artist talking about this stuff as well as scientists. Yes, and, and Steve Finkelstein brings both together because he's an amazing drummer as well as an environmental educator and a scientist. So maybe one day you'll bring your drum to our group. No, all right, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I, 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 I want to just mention as, as a... Oh, so sorry to interrupt. As, uh, as a, uh, John was as just a, raising his hand. Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, there was an organization many years ago called um, EAT, and I believe it was um, founded by Robert Rauschenberg, and it was a kind of merging of science and art. Um, and last night, overnight, I had this sort of uh, persistent image in my mind of two very large uh, earthen trails coming together and becoming one larger uh, trail. And, you know, I woke up this morning and I said to my partner, I think, um, you know, my dream was very much about this meeting and the meeting of, of science and culture. So, um, I, you know, I, I teach meditation. I've been doing that teaching for about 10 years. 
uh, Hildur, you have this context also of learning about, about healing. And part of what I was trying to do in Switzerland with New Consume was to say, when we are out of work, we have an opportunity to revision our self-image, the image we have of ourselves, and to identify with not working can be very uh, catalytic to discovering the creative process, to having no identity or a zero identity. And when you have nothing, you have everything. Um, in a meditative space, when we let go of our attachment to an identity, we get to feel everything and we get to connect with everything. And that connection happens in the here and now, in the body, because the body doesn't dwell in the future or in the past. The body dwells here in the now. So the breath sculpture was quite extraordinary for me as a transformational step or a process because after I was interdependently living with these plants, the moment that I came out of the glass house, I felt tactilely connected to all the trees around me. I felt that my body was interdependent and connected as one organism, as one big organism. There you are. And I have to tell you, what an amazing sensation that was. And sharing that in some way with 200,000 people around Europe and America with the fresh air sculpture over three years, that was a really big gift for me to, to, to experience myself, to have that, that connection with so many people and to know that um, they were feeling it, maybe not consciously, but they breathed it and they they produced it. Right. So excited to see your film next week, John. Yes, and, and, and all of us breathe for a living. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think we need that recognition, actually. If everybody realized that they actually do that. Uh, I, I myself have um, um, changed identity several times, uh, voluntarily retired early. Um, yeah. And uh, for a good reason, because I had to cure my climate angst by doing things like this. <laughs> because well, once, once you wake up, you're like, wait, stop, <laughs> let's change. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to mention uh, one of the foremost ecologists of the 20th century, E.O. Wilson, who studied ants in particular, uh, he wrote a book and a number of essays on biophilia, which is the human innate love of animals, plants, and the environment that they support. And, Wonderful. Uh, yes, and, and so uh, he was a storyteller, and in his stories, were it, it, that was his art form, expressing the natural world. And from him, I've taken many lessons, uh, and one of them is to get out there, explore, and, and you'll also get to experience uh, biophilia and um, address nature deficit disorder, which is the experience of not having enough nature in your life. Yes. And, 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 and let's just say, make this the theme, David. We have one minute left. Yes, let's, yes. Um, let's make this the theme for our next uh, Your Environment Now show, Biophilia. And we will be, play, we will be featuring John Halpern and his work. Uh, and relying on him to help us scientists communicate in a fun, interactive way uh, as we awaken. Um, and, and you may also take note about the beaver story and biophilia. I have a blog that I have, have written, Notes of a Queen's College Naturalist, too, uh, for yes, our discussion. I, I will, I've added everything here for the last minute. If you want to get um, any contacts or information, we can include that here in the chat, or um, we will just uh, see everybody same time next week, 10 a.m. Wednesday. And uh, I really look forward to go deeper into John's work. And- uh, well, Hildur, Hildur, thank you for the platform, Max. Thank you for your presentation. David, thank you for the data and all the interesting uh, information that you provided about Long Island. and. John, thank you so much for opening our eyes to a different way of expressing uh, 
uh, the environment and our connection to the environment. Uh, we'll be posting all this up on uh, the YouTube channel shortly. And uh, next show will be uh, next week. Uh, what date is that, Hildur? Um, that's, I believe, is it the 27th? May the 27th? Okay, they great. typically go to seven days uh, at a time, right? The week. At 10 a.m. So <laughs> and the monarch butterflies are arriving this week. Yeah, oh, the monarch. Keep your eyes out. And Keith, I have to say this. Thank you, because without you, we wouldn't be here. Oh, thank you, Hildor. So and thank you. Thank we're, you. We're, for all, we're all in it together. We're all in it yes. together. So yes. See you next thank week. You. Make sure you spread the word so that we get more folks involved. We can fit 100 folks on this. So uh, that would be fun. <laughs> that would be fun. I think right. now that we have some uh, uh, incredible artists on the call, we can, we can uh, drum our way to that. Yes, we I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like so it. We're going to be signing off now. And again, thank you, everyone. And uh, here we go. Bye. Wave bye-bye. Bye. bye. <laughs> bye.